What I would like to eventually see is a supersonic airliner that can reduce travel time by a factor of two for the average person flying. Uh, L.A. to New York I believe it's like two, two and a half hours or so. Currently we're limited by sonic booms. There's no regulation stipulating what kind of sonic booms can be projected over land. Right now the rule is no sonic booms over land. The boom is actually a, a shock wave, a pressure change that if you think of the aircraft here, that emanates off the nose of the aircraft. Sonic booms are, uh, are really just another uh, sound wave, just like you're hearing my voice now. Uh, simply put, a sonic boom is uh, an acoustic disturbance created when an aircraft or actually any projectile breaks the speed of sound. It makes a loud crackling noise, which can sound like a very loud thunder. Loud, noisy, got a call today from a woman who heard some sonic booms yesterday, said it frightened her dog. Wouldn't want to hear something that's as loud as a shotgun going off uh, rattle through your house. They're an annoyance, they're a disturbance. around the altitude, then you can do it. Otherwise, it's just not going to be able to get it done. Unless the point, unless it's an east-to-west run or the point is far enough to the, uh, close enough to the base that there's room to do it. The Whisper project is, well, it's part of a, a bigger effort in supersonics that NASA is undertaking with the long-range goal to have business jets and airliners that can fly supersonic over the U.S., over populated areas, and not break windows or even disturb the population. This test in particular goes towards to establishing that FAA limitation as to what sonic booms will be accepted, just like previous testing was done with airport noise and, and seeing the tolerance that could, could, that could be tolerated there, we're doing the same thing with sonic booms. So we do analysis to figure out what, where the pilot needs to fly. Um, we can't do that until we have the weather of the day because uh, weather plays a huge part in sonic boom placement. The challenging part for the team is that the weather balloon was going up as we were briefing and the scientists and engineers are getting the data now and they're frantically doing all these calculations so that by the time I get out to the airplane I've got these aim points that I'm flying at. and that was NASA 4. Copy that 850 run. And SA50, what were we reading in the uh, for your mouth? As far as the pilot's concerned, I'm the person they're talking to and they're expecting me to help them out with their situation because they're, they're going to be busy flying the airplane. Yeah, the control room's telling me a target time that they want the next boom. So then I set up a big racetrack out to the northeast trying to time my return so that the boom hits the ground at the right time. We use radar tracking from the ground and we can get position information from the aircraft using the radar and it tells us where they are in the airspace and the two parallel lines there, the supersonic corridor. So it just gives us as a controller on the ground situational awareness on where they are. And just for uh, info, it seems like about 130 knots. And uh, A50, you're a little broken there, but just wanted to make sure you heard uh, next dive point at uh, 0840. Again, we've got a, a steer point out there that I'm going to roll in and aim at. So actually, about eight miles prior to that, I need to be at 49,000 feet and 0.96 Mach, so still subsonic. I'm going to roll, pull down 53 degrees nose low, so pretty steep. Somewhere in there, we're going supersonic. We roll out, and we're trying to time it so that we hit 1.1 Mach at 40,000 feet aimed at that dive point out there um, at 53 degrees nose low. Oh, and on a proper heading of 246 degrees. So if all that works right, 
and the weather balloon got the right data and the engineers did all their calculations right, then a boom of a specific uh, volume will hit base housing. With Whisper, we're trying to get a readback from the people on the ground to some kind of annoyance level. Um, we have about 110 subjects uh, in the Edwards Air Force Base population that have been outfitted with several different survey methods, uh, pen and paper, um, iPhone, Apple devices, and web devices. This research, we're looking for low boom signatures, mostly. Different days and different times, we're asking to do different levels of sonic boom, sometimes low, medium, or high. So depending on the overpressures from the booms, how annoying was this low boom? How annoying was this more moderate uh, boom? And they'll be submitting surveys when they hear sonic booms produced by our F-18 jets. We have about about 14 or 15 different sensors out there to record the sonic booms. We have what we call our sonic boom field kits. They're, uh, they're remotely triggered sonic boom sensors. They're on light posts throughout the community. Um, they're powered by solar panel arrays, and then we have a microphone sitting towards the bottom on the ground uh, that actually records the sonic booms. Then we'll use that data, convert that into some type of metric like a decibel level, that, and um, then compare that to what um, Jack and Jill heard in their houses uh, during the testing. What we have is a, another sonic boom sensor, this one protected by an all-weather doghouse. Once I get the call that the aircraft is starting that dive maneuver, um, I'll come over here and wait approximately two minutes or so uh, for the sonic boom to reach the ground. Uh, come over here and manually trigger it once I hear a sonic boom. So two, this is Master Ground. Heard boom on the ground. It might have quieter than the last one. Um, it's pretty, pretty wet. We have uh, specific calls that they want us to make. Uh, most of it is so that the team on the ground knows when we're going to be rolling in, and then after that, when the boom is going to hit them, so that they make sure that the the instruments are all recording and capture that data. 30 seconds out, repeat, 30 seconds. Copy airborne. Six seconds. Rolling in three, two, one, now. Copy, Mark. We're planning on going Mach 1.8, Mach 1.6, so the cruise speed is roughly twice as fast as, uh, as a typical subsonic airliner. We're trying to advance the technologies in supersonics to allow companies that are around today and that aren't even around today will be able to, to take the, the technology that we develop here and the, and the understanding of the physics that we do here today uh, to open up a whole new market for the future. If long term we're going to have business jets and airliners, they're going to have to be quieter than military fighters or the Concorde. Everybody knows about the Concorde. Well, it made a very big sonic boom, and that disturbed people. It couldn't fly over land or cities. The sonic booms we're producing for Whisper are what we are simulating will be what we call low sonic booms or what the next generation of aircraft will, will produce. Performing research then becomes technology that's transferred to the commercial world. I think that at the heart is what NASA's role is. To understand where we've been and where we're headed and where we are now along that path, I think, is critical for the population to, to realize. And this type of research brings what we're doing right there to the homes of the people we're trying to do this for. It's a new market, a new type of aircraft. If the United States takes the lead in that, that's jobs for the American taxpayer. In 1947, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. So I like to think that it's my job to fix it now.
compass first behind him. I think we covered most of it, so I think I got to get out and uh, go make some booms.